Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Work From Home Show. I'm Naresh Vissa with Adam Schrader. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the work from homers out there today. We have Rowdy Gaines with us. Yes, that's Rowdy Gaines. You may have heard of him. He's referred to as swimming's greatest ambassador. His full name is Ambrose Rowdy Gaines. He's a three-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer, U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame member, member of the International Swimming Hall of Fame, and a swimming analyst for television networks, including ESPN and NBC. So, Rowdy, thank you for joining us on the Work From Home show to share your inspiring journey. Thank you, Nourish. Thank you, Adam. So good to be on with you guys. Yeah, and we're getting you on because uh, your journey is inspiring. There are a lot of our listeners who have dealt with really, really bad stuff. And you did, too. You struggled. You went from swimming in gator-infested neighborhood lakes to setting Olympic <laughs> records. So tell us how you did that. Well, I grew up in Winter Haven, Florida, which is like right in the middle of the state and surrounded by water. In fact, about 80% of the wa- uh, town is, is our lakes. So I grew up on a lake my whole life and learned how to swim when I was literally nine months old. My parents water skied for a place called Cypress Gardens, and uh, I was taught to swim at a very early age. But I didn't start swimming competitively until I was in high school. So junior in high school when I started swimming competitively. And uh, really the biggest reason was I kept getting cut from other sports. I tried off of five different sports, and I got cut in each one. So finally swimming sort of just stuck. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of your progression through the the ranks? Like, you know, you started swimming at nine months, but you ended, you know, Olympics, uh, you know, rec- record holder. Kind of what a – talk a little bit about that journey. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was a kid growing up, you know, I was a typical kid that just loved to do sports. Uh, I loved uh, being around my friends. And uh, when I finally discovered swimming was – when I discovered the passion to excel in it, so to speak. I I didn't think I was going to go to the Olympics, but I certainly had a dream of trying to further the career and maybe trying to go to college and earn a scholarship. I was a junior, as I said, I was in 11th grade, uh, but had no grand aspirations to go to the Olympics. But gradually I I got faster and just uh, started excelling and earned a scholarship to Auburn University and, um, I started in, in the winter of 1976. I broke my first world record two and a half years later and made the Olympic team in 1980, um, four years after I started swimming. Of course, in 1980, we didn't have an Olympics because there was a boycott, but uh, that was my first Olympic team. And then stuck around for another four years until I, I had 1984 and, and the Olympics in Los Angeles. You also, tell us about the struggles. Uh, Apparently you faced many, many struggles in high school and again in your 20s. And despite the struggles, you were still winning international swimming competitions. Tell us about those struggles and how you were able to stay focused. Yeah, definitely, Nourish. I mean, when I I was younger, I was... uh, I was a skinny little kid and and, uh, certainly made fun of in many ways and actually was bullied uh, quite a bit when I was in grade school. I remember, gosh, you know, during recess, hiding out in the bathroom and literally sitting on the stall so nobody would see my legs as they came through the stalls looking for me underneath. Um, So, you know, it was a little tricky here and there, but, uh, you know, again, I, I, I I tell kids this now is, you know, never give up on your dreams. I, I'm kind of living proof that uh, you're going to go through these, this life with a lot of peaks and valleys. And the true champions, at least I have found from the sport of swimming, are the ones that can live through the valleys uh, or live through the peaks, rather, which is the easy part, but also uh, suffering through the valleys and, and learning from those experiences. And, and I certainly learned from that. And 
um, later on in my life. It wasn't until I was about 31, but suffered a physical set, setback when I came down with Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurological disorder that strikes your nervous system. So basically, I was paralyzed for six months and spent about six months in the hospital. And that was a little touch and go there. But uh, again, family and friends uh, helped me out of that um, and uh, was able to come out of that and, and a better person and, and, and really kind of a, with a better appreciation for, for my health um, and never to take my health for granted again. Now, I have a two-part question here. Number one, you've said that you felt physically at your peak in 80 whenever the boycott happened mm -hmm. at the Olympics. So I want you to first touch on kind of how you dealt with the kind of the, I'm imagining kind of an emotionally crippling situation of being like, man, I feel my best. I'm doing amazing and I can't go show it off. But then, you know, years later, 16 years later, you qualified um, for the Olympic trials, but you didn't go and compete in the trials. What made you decide not to continue along that route? Well, getting back to your first question, you know, the boycott, it was really tough for us, Adam, because you got to remember that in swimming, the pinnacle of success for us is the Olympic Games. We don't yeah. have a Super Bowl World Series, you know. I <laughs> yeah, mean, America that's cares us, about swimming right? every four years. Yeah, that's Unless exactly right. Unless you swim in college. And, and, if you swim in college. Yeah, but I'm talking college, about the American public. You're right. You're yeah, right. American public Gen generally, you're right, though, Nourish. I mean, the, for a swimmer, yeah, you have the NCAA championship, the college championship, you have the world championships, Pan Ams. There's a lot of little short-term goals that you have. But uh, as Adam said, you know, from an American public standpoint, it's the yeah. Olympics. Yeah. And when that was taken away, it's very similar to what happened to the athletes a year ago um, when the Olympics were delayed. Ours were canceled, but theirs were delayed. It's a little apples and oranges because – you know, we were dealing with life and death a year ago. And for me, it was just a career, but it was emotionally tough for a lot of us. So there were 323 athletes that made the Olympic team in 1980 that didn't make it in 76 and also didn't make it in 84. I was very fortunate in the fact that I had 1984. I, I, I you know, I stuck it out and, uh, and was very blessed to have 1984. Um, and then, you know, you know, you flash forward and, um, and to today and you have the same situation that these athletes are feeling now to where they're trying to uh, get to their dream. And that dream is Tokyo this summer and in 2021. And Adam, what was the second part of your question again? Yeah, I was asking about how you when you decided, you know, you qualified for the Olympics in 96, but you chose oh, oh, 96, not to do it. Like right. what made you decide, right. th you know what, it's time for me to move on. I'm not going to do this. Right, right, right. So, you know, swimming is a sport you can do forever, but there is a point <laughs> where you feel like, you know, you can't quite compete against some of these other kids. And I was 37 at the time. And even though I qualify for trials, our, our Olympic trials in 96, I kind of felt like the opportunity to broadcast the Olympics was something very special. And NBC offered me the job to broadcast the Atlanta Olympics in 1996, and which included also broadcasting the Olympic trials. And I really felt like it was, uh, it was, it was just time to move on. Um, um, uh, to be quite honest with you, I don't think I would have made the team in 96. And to have this great opportunity to broadcast was really fun. And, and now, you know, that was, uh, that was my first over the air broadcast. And I did, I started in 92 with the, uh, with NBC with a triple cast, but, uh, two, uh, 2021 will be my eighth Olympic games, which is pretty cool to be able to say that uh, I've been part of eight Olympic games in the broadcasting. You touched a little bit about your sudden paralysis and Guillain-Barre syndrome. Mm -hmm. First off, what is Guillain-Barre syndrome? Right. You were paralyzed. How did you, how did you recover from yeah. that? Yeah, crazy. Yeah, it was it was certainly scary, Narush. I mean, I um, it was funny because I'm walking around one day and I feel great, but literally within 24 hours, this is the summer of 1991. I was 32 years old, literally within 24 hours, um, I was completely paralyzed and it, and it felt like everything started moving in slow motion. And fortunately my wife, uh, recognized that something was seriously wrong and she, 
um, put me in a car and drove me to the emergency room. And um, I had a great doctor who diagnosed it right away. And uh, but everything uh, just shuts down. So Guillain-Barre, it's discovered by two French scientists. Some people call it Guillain Barre. It doesn't really matter, but it's pronounced technically Guillain-Barre. Um, uh, it, it's a neurological disorder that there's a sheath, and I'm not up on it scientifically, but there's a sheath that surrounds your nerve. It's called the myelin sheath. And basically what that disease does is it shreds that sheath. So your nerves sort of short circuit and uh, they are, are ren rendered useless. And for me, uh, that meant complete paralysis. And um, some people make a, you know, a quick comeback and recovery. And then some people, it takes longer, and some people never recover from it. Uh, is it for just me, a, it took about six months. Is it supposed months. to just go away? Like you just do nothing and it goes away? Or you In have most to cases, here. No, no, you, you, it doesn't go away. You, you, back then when I got it, you go through a, a thing called plasmapheresis, which basically is sort of like uh, uh, removing your blood and, and removing the antibodies in the blood and then putting your own blood back in you. I know that's like a very simplistic way of saying it. It's sort of like kidney dialysis. And uh, so they started doing that. It, it, for me, it was very painful. So the first couple of weeks, it was, it was really, really tough. Uh, but you get used to it, and they started doing that like every other day for three months. And, you know, you start to – things turn around, and you start to learn how to do everything all over again. You learn how to walk and brush your teeth, and you start from ground zero all over again. And uh, But I was very fortunate. I made a full recovery, and it took about – like I said, it took about a year before I finally felt normal. Um, but today, you know, 30 years later, I, I, I certainly feel – I mean, I'm old, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I, I certainly feel the effects of age, but I certainly made a full recovery. And how old were you when this happened? 32. So, so you, were, you were still in the middle, uh, I don't want to say your peak career, but you, you were still swimming professionally mm -hmm. when this happened. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I had just come back from a swim meet in Japan. I had competed in Japan at a competition. Um, and... Uh, and felt great, you know. I I swam some really fast times. I broke a couple of world records uh, in master swimming, but you know, I felt really good about where I was, and even thinking about you know going to the Olympics again in '92. And of course, this happened, and, and that was a huge setback, obviously. But um, but yeah, it was uh, it was a it was definitely a crazy time. But I had a lot of support with family and friends, and. Uh, and uh, I had two children at the time, and, um, you know, they, they helped me tremendously, even though they were young. But just to be able to pick up my child was a big goal of mine, you know. Uh, pick up my, uh, my two-year-old was a big goal of mine and uh, eventually reached that. I want to go back to, you know, you talked about starting swimming whenever you're in high school. And this is one thing I want to kind of touch on for um, the parents out there. We see a lot of kids specializing at a very young age, you obviously didn't specialize in swimming whenever you were a kid. Um, what are your thoughts on the specialization of kids? Is it being done correctly? Is it being done too early? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I always say, you know, and everybody has their own opinion about this, but my opinion is a kid needs to be a kid, you know, and enjoy life. And, and that means enjoy different experiences, whether it's in sports or the arts uh, or what have you. I think it's, it's just really important that they learn to love life at that age and be, uh, be a real kid. Um, I, I always tell parents that, you know, they're standing next to their eight year old and they're asking me, when should they start, uh, swimming doubles, meaning swimming in the morning and in the afternoon. And I look at them and I say, you know, there's never been a, a child that's been 10 and under, break a national record. You can break national records in different age groups, 10 and under, 11 and 12, 13, 14. Um, there's never been one that's broken a, a national record at a 10 and under ever make the Olympic team. So my point is it, it, it doesn't matter how good you're at 10 years old because history will prove you'll never make the Olympics. So my advice is to be well-rounded, um, have them do band one day and then the chess club another and then swimming practice the other and Sooner or later, they'll find their niche and they'll find their passion and they'll find something that they really love. And sometimes it happens at 10 or 11 or 12. And sometimes it doesn't happen until 
you're 17 or 18, and sometimes it doesn't happen until your 30s or 40s. You know, everybody's so different. And uh, so I, I, I really hesitate in telling parents to specialize in something, whether it's a stroke or an event or even a sport at an early age. You are currently doing a tour publicizing and encouraging parents to put their children in swimming lessons. And I'm, I'm actually putting my 16-month-old son in swimming lessons uh, in two weeks. So he'll most likely have his first class. Uh, I think it's important to be able to swim, but wh- why do you think, with all your experience, why is it critical for infants and children, youth, to take swimming lessons, and even adults who don't know how to swim? Right. Uh, first of all, I am so proud of you, buddy, to be able to do that. It's, that's, so, that's so wonderful of you to put your child in swim lessons because drowning uh, is an epidemic in our country. It's the number one cause of unintentional death in children four years of age and younger. And it's the number two cause for five to 14. So, you know, uh, we really have, uh, not literally, but figuratively, we've sort of found the cure to to drowning and that's swim lessons, to put your child in swim lessons because it prevents drowning by uh, about 90%. And uh, so I I literally, I beg parents, I, I beg people, I beg adults to put their children and young ones in swim lessons because it really it is an impetus to to prevent that that tragic thing that I've seen affect so many communities and that's drowning, um, and that's one reason why I'm really proud of our organization. I work for the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance, and we have a foundation called Step Into Swim, which does just that. It it makes grants to to lesson providers across the country to to help uh, swim, especially help teach those. Uh, kids in underserved areas, uh, the gift of swimming, because it is a gift. It's something you can enjoy the rest of your life. My kids have been on swim team, like summer swim teams for the last couple of years. And it's always fun to watch it because they do all of the strokes in there and watching like Mm -hmm. seven to 12 year olds trying to do like the butterfly is well, I, I mean, it'd be hilarious to watch me try to do it. I'm sure too. I was gonna say watching but, anyone try to do it, but watching them, like I, I watched my, I watched my kid. He swam a, a 25 in the butterfly, and probably I don't know. I'd say about a minute and a half. Um, it's it's incredible to me. What was your favorite uh, stroke? Like, if you were just gonna go out and swim, would it just be freestyle, or kind of what's your preferred strokes? Well, the stroke that I won the gold medal in was freestyle. I won the 100-meter free, and I was on two relays that, that I swam free on. Um, but really, my favorite stroke was always backstroke because, you know, you can breathe a lot. You pull on the lane lines. Uh, don't Same. recommend that to kids, but, uh, mm-hmm. right, you know, you, so uh, I was always a big backstroke. Or my least favorite stroke is, is, is breaststroke, or my least favorite is butterfly. My worst stroke is breaststroke. But, uh, yeah, butterfly, I'm not much of a butterfly either. I struggle with that one. Um, but, uh, you know, I just love being in the water. I don't know about you, Adam, but, you know, watching your kids be in the water is such a, brings you such great joy because, uh, whenever I've had the most love and joy with my family, I have four daughters and three granddaughters is, is when we're around water, you know, when we're in the pool in our backyard pool or at a public pool. And, uh, and that's brought, that's brought me personal joy the most. Now, I want to ask one last question here. Whenever I'm watching swimming, like on th- at the Olympic level, and I mean, I'm honestly one of the people who watches it pretty much every four years because that's when it's on TV. You know, you constantly see people coming in and swimming faster and faster and just breaking all these records. Are we nearing a point where people can't go much faster? Or is it mostly like suit related mm-hmm. at this point? Or kind of what are your thoughts on where swimming is heading? Well, there's no doubt that swimming will always be faster. And and I'll give you the example. The 50-yard freestyle, when I was a junior in high school, 1976, first man ever broke 20. He went 19.7. Joe Bottom went 19.7, which we thought was no way anybody was going to go faster. 20 years later, exactly 20 years later, 1996, the first man went under 19 seconds. He went 18.7. And then just about three or four years ago, Caleb Dressel broke 18 for the sec, uh, for the first time. So eventually, I think you're going to see some sort of leveling off. Um, 
but we have so many events across so many different platforms that records will always be made to be broken. Will they be broken by much less? Absolutely. Will it be 40 years before somebody breaks 17? Maybe. But somebody's going to break 17 sometime. Maybe not in our lifetime, but certainly it's going to happen. And uh, there's obviously got to be an end in sight, but it's not going to happen in our lifetimes, that's for sure. Rowdy, I'm just curious. We talked a lot about before your career, getting ready for it during your career, but post-career, you've made a very good living. You work for a few companies, some nonprofits, trade organizations. Mm-hmm. You're a swimming analyst for TV networks, but you're an Olymp- mm-hmm. multiple uh, three-time Olympic gold medalist swimmer. Uh, someone like Michael Phelps, I mean, he's a household name. Like I would say right. almost everyone in this country above the age of 20 years old knows who Michael Phelps is because he gripped the country. But your average swimmer who goes to the Olympics, swims, maybe gets a bronze medal, what do they end up doing after their career is over? Well, the good news is, for the most part, um, swimmers are really smart. Um, And guys, you know, I mean, you've been around swimming. Swimming requires a lot, a lot of dedication, a lot of commitment, a lot of responsibility. You learn a lot about teamwork. Any you sport, learn a lot yeah. about setting goals. Yeah, yeah any, any sport. sport. You're right. And of course, I'm just biased towards swimming. That's all. Um, <laughs> and uh, and I think swimming teaches you those kinds of values that last, last a lifetime. And I think most swimmers end up learning so much about swimming and during their career that whether they retire at 21 after they finish college or they finish at 30, 35 years old like Michael Phelps did, they learn a lot about um how to go forward with their life because of swimming. Um, And I can tell you that's so true for myself. I just learned about swimming and it helped me um, persevere through different avenues of my life, you know, whether it was not being an advocate for water safety or um, uh, giving back to my sport somehow or another in other areas or in in a broadcasting role. I, I, I feel like swimming taught me that. And I think swimmers, regardless of how they finish out their career, usually learn that. And if you look at GPAs of colleges across the country, swimming is a sport that's always in the top five across the board. So, uh, uh, you know, you, you have to learn that, definitely, that discipline. Rowdy gains multiple gold medal winning swimmer, U.S. Olympic Hall of Fame member, swimming's greatest ambassador thank you so much for joining us on the work from home show the website is rowdygains.com that's g-a-i-n-e-s rowdygains.com check us out at workfromhomeshow.com email us if you have any questions hello at workfromhomeshow.com leave us a review on whatever podcasting platform you use follow us on social media we're everywhere and until next week keep on working from home